Welcome to the Whiskey Rebellion. Whiskey Rebellion. Oh, oh, Tom Cruise, help me. Oh, oh, fuck. Tom Cruise, save me with your food and magic. Hello featured players and welcome to another episode of Inebriated Antiquity. Today we're going to cover the Whiskey Rebellion. I'm Tate. I'm Adam. And this is the only show on the internet where we drink and talk about history. Mostly drink though. Oh yeah, we're hurting ourselves today. As the cold intro showed you, today we're drinking a 77% moonshine. They say it tastes like uh, wild berries, but it tastes like uh, if you ever decided to just tongue kiss lava like that but we've discovered that if you mix it with something it's actually really pleasant yeah it goes well with sprite i'm drinking it with pepsi and it tastes like a like a wild berry pepsi so mix it don't 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 shoot it this is a, this is a psa from us to you we love you and don't want you to die the whiskey rebellion Whiskey Rebellion. This was a popular uprising in 1794 of farmers and distillers, mostly in western Pennsylvania. Almost uh, exclusively in western Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, to protest uh, a whiskey tax enacted by the federal government. Uh, following years of aggression with tax collectors, uh, the region finally exploded into a confrontation that resulted in President Washington actually marching with troops into western Pennsylvania. Against those, you know, uppity farmers who wouldn't pay their whiskey tax. Yeah. Uh, the whiskey tax became law in 1791 and was intended to generate revenue for the war debt incurred during the Revolutionary War. Yeah. The tax applied to all distilled spirits, but considering uh, we couldn't get rum in the country anymore because of things happened during the war, uh, whiskey consumption was on the main climb. Uh, so the excise tax became widely known as the whiskey tax. Uh, so the farmers of the western frontier were accustomed to distilling their surplus rye, barley, wheat, and corn uh, into whiskey. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to transport. It's a lot of mass. Yeah, it's just easier to, you know. Plus, it doesn't doesn't last. You know, it can you you're, you hold your grain too long, it can rot. Yep. This was just an easier way for them to move surplus yeah, and make some extra cash. You f you clear field of wheat or rye or anything. You've got seventy wagonfuls of grain, but when you compact it down into whiskey, you could fit that entire field in a wagon or two. Yeah. And that's one of the things, the farmers resisted the tax uh, in the region, whiskey served as a medium of exchange. Again, yeah. you know, hey, I need a couple pigs, um, trade you. Well, I've got a couple pigs and I, I really like whiskey, so um, yeah, let's make that trade. Yeah, the, the barter system was, I mean, the, these people out in uh, Western Pennsylvania, you know, they, they just didn't see cash. Not to mention this is the, the brand new federal government. Yeah. The money been around for like 15 seconds. Um, printed money was <laughs> not that well dispersed. Ah, there it is! It's beautiful! Take your hat off, boy, that's a dollar bill! Many of the resistors were themselves war veterans who believed they were continuing to fight the same principles they had fought for the American Revolution. Taxation without representation. Uh, while the federal government maintained the tax for a legal expression of congressional taxation powers. Opposition to the whiskey tax and the rebellion itself built support uh, for the Republicans who eventually overtook Washington's Federalist Party in 1802. The Whiskey Rebellion is a fundamental change in early America. Yeah. It defined what the federal government could continue doing. Most for better people, or worse. For better or worse, most people in the beginning didn't think this was something they legally had the right to do. And this set precedence. And once you set precedence, it's it's hard to change it. Yeah. 
Judge Rushing, the U.S. federal government began operating in, what, 1789, mm -hmm. and ratification for a new constitution. Before this, they were working under the Articles of Confederacy, and they'd been unable to levy taxes because of this. But with the Constitution, they got into the new government powers, and with that is taxes. But at this point, the government from the revolution and everything else they did to set up the government was about $54 million in debt. And they had to borrow a lot of money to pay for this. So to be able to return this money, they decided they were going to go levy the whiskey tax, among other things, but this was the big one. And during this, the Secretary of Treasury, the right up there mustache twirling villain of this story, Alexander Hamilton, sought to use this tax to completely wipe the debt of America. He was going to collect $54 million in whiskey taxes. In his report, let's see, it was, it was a report of public credit. Yeah. Before public credit, he urged Congress to consolidate the state and national debt into a single debt. Now, this wasn't technically allowed, but the states were like, yeah, this is a great idea. We're in debt and you're just going to take it from us? This is a great idea. Because instantly, the states were flush with cash. So they had no issue with this. But the federal government was now in all of the debt. So it started going, hey, you know what we can do to get rid of this debt? Tax things. Tax things. And thus they did. Congress approved the measures in June and July of 1790. Originally, to George Washington's credit, he was against this. So Hamilton convinced him to go, hey, why don't you just go around to the people and ask them what they think. So he did. Which again, still sounds like a good plan. Yeah. But Washington didn't go to the people, he went to the local governments. The states. And the states were like, taxes? Good job. You know, we like taxes. Get more money for things? This is, this is a good idea. So, throughout all of this, Washington was just being spoon-fed. He was like, hey, I went around, I talked to the people, and they were like, this is a good idea. We should do this. Taxes are a good thing. So, he went back to Congress, and they passed the whiskey tax. Almost immediately, eh, protests began. They were arguing that the tax was unfair. It was, you know, showing favoritism to large producers. It was showing favoritism to eastern producers. And it just wasn't working, because the eastern producers, or the large producers, were getting tax breaks from this. They could, okay. Let's start with how the whiskey tax works. For every gallon of whiskey you produce, you pay the federal government nine cents. Okay, sounds like, well, that's fine. Heck, I would love taxes like that nowadays. But Adam, how much did a gallon of whiskey cost back in 1790? 10 cents. 10 cents. So that's how much you bought whiskey for. That's not considering how much it costs to make it, which again, sure, it's cheap. It costs you probably three cents to make a gallon of whiskey. Yeah. But when they're charging you nine cents on the gallon, you're making a penny. You're making a penny, but then you're losing two pennies. Yeah. Because of what it took to, you had to raise the wheat, you had to take the time and effort to mash it and distill it and- To the Western it. producers, this was a 90% tax. On That's something insane. That you made negative two pennies on when you sold yeah. it. The Eastern producers, on the other hand, they were able to get tax breaks. The, if you made over a certain amount, mm -hmm. you could pay less because you're like, oh, you're producing more, so we're guaranteed this money, so we'll charge you less. Yeah. And it was a structured deal. One, it could go, some people didn't have much of a break. They were like, they were paying eight or seven cents, but they were selling it at a higher price. Or some people got all the way down to like three cents a gallon, which they could pay at the end of the year. This was another thing that hurt the Western guys because one, they didn't sell for cash. Yeah. And two, they had to pay in cash. You couldn't, and these yeah. were people were going, hey, again, I need that pig, here's some whiskey. But they couldn't pay their taxes in pigs. They had to pay yeah. in cash that they didn't have. So 
it was a divide that no one took the time to really think about. They're yeah. like, well, the Eastern guys are like, this is fine. They're selling in cities, they make cash money for it, and they pay some of that cash to us at the end of the year. And of course, as always, they're the more population dense, yep. so they get more representation in government. So they were they were able to more easily sway any of these votes. Exactly. And all of these little things, they, they built up until you ended up with the whole western side of the country built, was like, look, this, this can't happen. We were literally losing money to try to sell our products. And since no one can pay cash with it, unless you're going to start taking pigs and nails, yeah. there's no way we have to physically pay you the money you're asking. All right, so the population of West, uh, Western Pennsylvania was about 17,000 people in 1790. Uh, among the farmers of the region, the wet, wet whiskey excise tax was immediately controversial. I mean, this was... That might was, be an understatement. This was, this was an immediately bad idea. Um, with many people in Frontier arguing that it unfairly targeted them, uh, Whiskey was a popular drink, and farmers, I mean, most of the time supplemented their income with small stills. You could have a still in the barn, and, you know, this was just a thing that you did. Um, you know, nowadays we think of stills and making your own whiskey as a thing of bootleggers and, you know, the, the Dukes of Hazard, but this was a thing that everybody did. I mean, we didn't, they didn't have large-scale, uh, alcohol production in America like they had in Europe or that we would eventually have in this country. Yeah, farmers living in the uh, west of the Appalachian Mount Mountains uh, distilled their excess grain into whiskey, uh, which was much more profitable to transport over the mountains than all that grain. Like you were saying, where you, you couldn't afford, you'd need the wagons, you need the oxen, you need men to pull, the, to, to work the wagons, to pull seven, eight, ten loads of wagons to get enough grain over to make it worth the trip guards even yeah because this was not a peaceful time in america no. um this was the wild this this was the wild west i mean you can think about this is western pennsylvania that's that's that's, that's nothing a, that's original but colony that's that's the edge of the world to them everything else out there is, is indian territory um and like you're saying cash was in short supply in the frontier nobody had it you didn't just have it to throw down to pay your taxes. Even poorer people, they were paid in whiskey. Yeah. It was something with enough value that people were willing to work for this. Yeah. Because it could be used for drinking, it could be used for trading, used for medicine, or, yeah. you know, any of these things. This was, you, go, you go work for a farmer, he pays you in a bottle, you can still turn around and trade that bottle for things you need. For things you need. It yeah. was, again, the barter system was, was it wasn't perfect. But again, it was a way of life for these people. And this law was basically going to take their way of life and just throw it out the window. Yeah, completely wreck them. Uh, small scale farmers also protested that Hamilton's excise uh, effectively gave unfair tax breaks to large distillers, uh, most of which were on the eastern side of the Appalachians. Uh, the regressive nature of the tax was further compounded by an additional factor whiskey sold for considerably less in the cash poor western frontier than in the wealthier more populous east. This meant that even if all distillers that are required to pay the same amount of tax per gallon, the small scale frontier distillers would still, you know, they would still make less money. A, that's the thing, a large amount of the small scale distillers believe that Hamilton was deliberately doing this, that he was in bed with these big businesses. Uh, a lot of other parts of the laws, law caused concern. Um, the law required all stills to be registered. Um, and uh, anyone who was cited for failure to pay the tax had to appear in court, not in the local court. No, like, you had to take yourself all the way to the other side of the mountains, to the east, to show up for court. Like, this this so, became a federal tax this, crime? This became a federal tax crime that you couldn't go to your local magistrate and handle. Yeah, it, the, they had to show up to the only federal courthouse in Philadelphia, 300 miles away. And the only one. So. A 300 mile trek, 
so that you could have the privilege of showing up in court for them to say you didn't pay your taxes. Uh, from the beginning, the federal government had little access in, or little success in collecting the whiskey tax. Uh, many small western distillers simply just refused to pay it. I mean, again, who was there to stop them? Yeah, as you do. Uh, federal revenue officers and local residents who assisted them bore the brunt of the protesters' uh, uh, wrath. Uh, tax rebels harassed several whis whiskey tax collectors and threatened to beat those who offered them office spaces or houses. <laughs> Again, these tax collectors were not locals. These were guys from from the east that had to come set up, try to get everybody listed down, and try to collect the proper amount of tax. So if you were an <laughs> innkeeper and offered this guy a room to rent, you might get your ass beat because you even gave him a room to rent. Or hey, you own a building, and that guy wants to rent office space out of it so he can run his tax collecting. And you're like, well, I like money. But then everyone in the community is like, you do it, we're going to kill you. I like my life better than money. Yeah. So, yeah. Like I said, to say this was an unpopular tax is an understatement. Yeah. Um, in addition to the tax itself, uh, many of the people out west had other grievances that were, again, they're complaining to the government. We have problems. And the government's like, pay whiskey tax. They're like, no, no, no. We have other problems that yeah. we... You know, you guys aren't make, meeting our list of problems we have. You're giving us more problems. Yeah, at the time, the Northwestern Indian War was going on, and America was not winning it. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, the Native American tribes were, I mean, pushing back. We were invading their space, and they were pushing back. So these Western farmers, again, cool, I'm going to go try to take my grain. I'm going to try to take my whiskey to, to, to market, yeah. and I've got to survive raids. And the mountains. And the mountains. And the Spanish, because they couldn't use the Mississippi. Yep, Spanish controlled Spain the Mississippi. <laughs> and they said, no, you, you can't use the Mississippi. Yeah, so this was not a good time for these people. Yeah, this was this was seen by the basic farmers and, and distillers in the West uh, as economic warfare, and they blamed Hamilton. And eventually, it got to the point of blaming Washington. So, as it is, the law is an immediate failure. You know, no one's paying it. No one's able to enforce it because of this, you know, the intimidation and the protests. So, it's, it's a failure. Excise officers sent to collect the tax were instantly met with protests and violence. And, you know, some people just flat out like, nah, I'm not paying that. That's yeah. dumb. Um, so inevitably, maybe perhaps inevitably, I don't know, but violence broke out. The first time, they did non-violently. It was like, nope, I'm not paying it, yeah. I'm protesting this tax. And in 1791, again on September 11th of all things, yeah. it got ratched up one notch. Well, I say one notch, but it went from, I'm not paying it, to I'm a tar and feather a motherfucker. Tar and feather and make them ride the pole. Yeah, and again, we we talk about this in like American history. It's like, oh, they tar and feathered people. This is pouring molten tar onto a person. This is not like, aha, uh -huh, put some glue on you and put some feathers. Boiling this is tar. boiling tar. This is what they used to use in siege warfare to make people run away from castles. So they poured this man, just coated him with boiling tar and then feathers. And then made him ride on a pole as yeah. they carried him through town to show him off. Yeah, so this was not pleasant, and I don't wish this on anyone, but you know, anyone has to go through it, tax collectors. <laughs> yeah, so um, the tax collector's name was Robert Johnson, and yes, they, they tar and feathered him, they put him on a pole through town, and that wasn't enough, so they decided to whip him while they were doing it. At this point, the people in Philly are like, they don't like this tax. No. This is getting pretty obvious. Let's double down on it. But, you know, protesters were like, we don't like this tax. We're following the exact same playbook as we went by just a few years ago. It was like, all right, uh, tax collectors from England, tar and feather them. Yeah. And yeah, we're, we're doing the Revolutionary War playbook. 
Yeah. So the two sides were completely polar opposite in this. Yeah. So, you know, some of the older accounts and even most of the modern takings of it was the Whiskey Rebellion was strictly in Pennsylvania. But this was not. This spread like wildfire. This was in the Carolinas. This was in Virginia. This, this went all the way down to Georgia. Yeah. You know, everyone was like, this tax is messed up. We have nothing to do with the U.S. government. Yeah. And they're trying to just destroy us by making us pay more than our whiskey is worth in taxes. So it just, it came to a head. Um, in like, in 1792, Alexander Hamilton went straight to the military option. He really is a just... Mustache twirling villain. Yeah. I mean, what the hell, Hamilton? You get a play about you and you were a bastard. It was a lie. Luckily, there was one person that had a half-assed cool head. Yeah. Yeah. Edmund. Edmund. Randolph. The Lovely name. Almost hero of the story. He argued that there was insufficient evidence to justify going straight to war with these farmers. 1793, Pennsylvania excise officer Benjamin Wells, his house was broken into twice. His office was broken into a few times. Um, the first time the mob forced their way in and they assaulted him, his wife, and his children. They were not playing around in this incident. Uh, the second was only like six dudes, but they were disguised, and they attacked Wells while he was at home, and they demanded his account books, and they were, you know, they were going to prove that, look, this is how it's happening. Look, these people paying less than us. They forced him at gunpoint to hand over the books. Uh, they were feeling completely unrepresented in Congress. You know, they were legit. They had legitimate yeah. means here, but, you know, they took it a step up, and it got bad. Um, radical members, they were going for open rebellion. Moderates like Hugh Henry Brackenridge, he wanted to take it down a little bit and consolidate with the government. Like, look, we can probably work this out. Yeah. We just, we have to talk, stop tarring feathering people. And they have to try to stop sending tax men. And unfortunately, that is not how this story goes. No. In the summer of 1794, Federal Marshal David Lennox began the process of serving writs to 60 different stillers in western Pennsylvania uh, who had not paid their taxes. On July 14th, Lennox accepted the services of tax collectors and wealthy landowner John Neville as a guide through Allegheny County. I think I'm saying that right? That's a place in Pennsylvania, apparently. Yeah. Uh, on July 15th, they approached the home of William Miller, who refused to accept his summons. Uh, an argument ensued, and when Lennox and Neville rode off, they were face to face with an angry mob. Uh, it, again, it had kicked up a notch at this point. Oh, yeah. Uh, an angry mob, literally, of men with pitchforks and muskets. Like, this is the chasing Frankenstein angry mob. And it's believed that a majority of them were drunk. I mean, we salute you. Uh, someone had told the mob that federal agents were dragging people away, but Lennox and Neville were allowed to pass once they were understood. Once this was understood to be untrue. Uh, nonetheless, a shot was fired as the two men rode away. Uh, on the morning of July 16th, Neville was asleep at his home, Bower Hill, when he was awakened by a crowd of angry men some of whom had been served summons the previous day. The men claimed that Lennox needed to come with them because there was a threat to his life. Neville didn't believe the men and ordered them off of his property. Uh, when the mob refused to move, Neville grabbed a gun and shot into the crowd, uh, striking and killing Oliver Miller. Uh, in retaliation, the mob shot back at the house. Uh, once Neville made it into the house, he decided to sound a signal horn, after which uh, he basically made his slaves go fight the crowd with firearms. Yes, six members of the mob were wounded, uh, and eventually the, the crowd uh, was able to collect Miller's body. Uh, Miller was an actual war hero of the revolution. Yeah. Uh, the American Revolution. This was a war hero. And uh, they collected his body and ran away. They basically, I mean, the cooler heads did not 
prevail. These guys, you know, there were no cooler heads at this point in time. These guys basically went and had a meeting and decided that Neville's got to pay. This is going to escalate even farther. Yeah. At no point in any of these processes did anyone decide to actually sit down and talk with the other side. No. This thing literally kept being escalation after escalation after escalation. Uh, as many as 700 men marched uh, on the property. They demanded the surrender, uh, but a Major James Kirkpatrick, who was there defending the property with 10 other soldiers, uh, informed them that Neville was not there. The truth was he wasn't. Yes, Kirkpatrick had arrived earlier with these soldiers and allowed Neville to escape. To go hide in a hill or in a pole. <laughs> yeah, he literally went and hid in a ditch, in a ravine. Uh, the mob demanded the soldiers surrender. When that request was refused, they set fire to the barn and slave quarters. Mm. The Neville women were allowed to flee to safety, after which the mob opened fire on the house. Following an hour of gunfire, uh, the mob's leader, James McFarland, was killed. In a rage, the mob then set fire to the rest of the buildings and burnt the entire Bower Estate to the ground. To the ground. So, less than a week after the Bower Estate incident, we have the threat to Pittsburgh. A mob met with Lokada and Terry's, and they were warned that Washington is going to send an entire army to strike them down. Yeah. And they got to strike first. Wealthy Landover, David Bradford, along with several other men, attacked a mail carrier. And this mail carrier, this, they had three letters from Pittsburgh expressing disapproval of the attack to Bowers estate. Now, again, Bradford used this probably a little bit out of context here. Yeah. But he was able to round up a mob of 7,000 people because of these three letters. <laughs> Every able-bodied man in western Pennsylvania. They all gathered and they marched towards Pittsburgh. They stopped at a place called Braddock's Field. Um, it was east of the city and Pittsburgh freaked out. Because yeah. they're like, um, there's an army. There's an army. There's an army like literally right outside the gates. But this time cooler heads did prevail. They sent people out and like, hey guys, what's going on? And the guys out there gave their grievances. So Pittsburgh was like, okay, yeah, we get it. You know, it, that seems unfair. So what we're gonna let you do is, one, here's a bunch of whiskey. I don't know if this was to rub yeah. salt in the wound or they just generally were like, go ahead, have fun. But then they let the guys, as long as they were peaceful, go ahead and have a march through Pittsburgh. Yes. And the guys did. They were like, yeah, this is great. We're getting to show our grievances. We're able to finally do it peacefully. This is wonderful. Yes. Maybe good things will come from this. Probably but then not. comes our mustache twirling villain. Hamilton took this opportunity to send Washington a letter. In this letter, he was like, oh no, there's an army of 7,000 people that's gonna invade Pittsburgh. This is gonna be the end of America. President Washington, reading this letter from Hamilton, was confronted with what he assumed was, yeah, this is the end of America. This, yeah. this lasted like 15 minutes and it's over, so we gotta do something. But Washington, again, still not perfect in this situation, but he had a cool head. He went to the rest of the government cabinet members and everything, he was like, look, we need to figure out what we can and can't do at this point to maintain governmental authority. The hero of the story, Edmund Randolph, tried to go for consolidation. Meanwhile, mustache twirler himself was busy publishing essays throughout Pennsylvania and Philadelphia under the name of Tully, showing how this mob is so violent and they're killing people and they're gonna take over everything and this is the end of America. Is this legitimate or original fake news? Yes. He, he invented this bullshit. Well, he didn't invent it. He, he took it from some other people in the past, I guess. But <laughs> yeah, he, he le legitimately told Washington and them through these fake letters that are like, yeah, this is a violent, crazy mob. They're going to kill America. This is the end. There are 7,000 armed insurrectionists. So Washington bought it. 
And while they were preparing these diplomats that, again, had no hope of consolidation at this point because the military action was going to happen, because Washington and the Congress drew up the Militia Act of 1792. And August 4th, 1794, he did. He drafted, or he pulled up and drafted militia and pulled 17,000 troops to stomp this insurrection, which I guess in his mind, this was okay. Because he's yeah. like, hey, 7,000 people, you need double to ensure military victory at this point in time. Let's do this. Yeah. And he sent this story down a much darker path. Yeah. This was so unpopular that there was a secondary set of riots that almost broke out into another mini rebellion to refuse this order. It got to a point that they were rounding up people forcefully to join the military. Yeah, they, this was conscription. Conscription the by gunpoint. Uh, so in early August 1794, uh, Washington dispatched three commissioners uh, to the West, all of them Pennsylvanians. Uh, the Attorney General, William Bradford, uh, Justice Jasper Yates of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, and Senator James Ross. Beginning on August 21st, the commissioners met with a committee of Westerners that included Breckenridge and Gallatin. Government commissioners told the committee that it must unanimously agree to renounce violence and submit to the U.S. law and that popular referendums must be held to determine if the local people supported this decision. Uh, those who agreed to these terms would be given amnesty from any further prosecution. Uh, the committee was divided between radicals and moderates and narrowly passed a resolution agreeing to submit to the government's terms. Uh, the popular referendum was held on September 11th and also produced mixed results. Some townships overwhelmingly supported the, supporting the U.S. laws, but opposition to the government remained strong in areas where the poor and the landless people uh, were predominant. Uh, on September 24th, 1794, Washington received a recommendation from the commissioners that in their judgment, it was necessary that the civil authority should be aided by a military force in order to secure a due execution of the laws. That was their death sentence. Do what we tell you. As soon as Washington else. saw that, that's it. That, that this was this was the local authority saying, yes, we want troops to put down our own people. Um, on September 25th, Washington issued a proclamation summoning the New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia militias into service and warned that anyone who aided the insurgents did so at their own peril. Uh, the trend was towards submission. However, the Western dis Westerners dispatched representatives William Findlay and David Reddick to meet with Washington and to halt the progress of an oncoming army. Uh, Washington and Hamilton declined this meeting. Uh, Washington and Hamilton basically decided that if they didn't march now, that no one was ever going to respect the U.S. government. Whether you believe that's a good thing or not, you got to realize this is this is a loaded gun, and it's been pointed at the American people, and they were 100% willing to use it. Yeah, this is no, we're going to wave it in front of everybody so they know we've got it. That we're going to there there were they were determined to make the American people feel this is who we are. You will do what you're told. Uh, under the authority of the recently passed federal militia law, the state militias were called up by the governors of New Jersey, Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. The federalized militia forces of 12,950 men was a rather large army by American standards at the time. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of folks. Uh, this was comparable to Washington's forces he literally led during the revolution. Uh, as we were saying before, relatively few men volunteered for militia service, so a draft had to be used to fill out the ranks. Uh, draft evasion was widespread. Again, we go from the beginning of this to going, hey, there's a tax on whiskey, you gotta pay it. And they said no. And now they're like, hey, now we're calling up troops to go fight these people who didn't pay their taxes. 
and the people are still saying no. But never did they figure this was At not a no good idea. At no point yet did they decide, maybe we're the assholes in this conversation. Uh, three counties in eastern Virginia were the actual scenes of armed draft resistance. In Maryland, uh, Governor Thomas Sim Lee sent 800 men to stop a riot in Hagerstown who were literally rioting because of the conscription. Yeah. Weren't there people arrested in this town? Yes. Over 150 people were, were arrested. So we can't draft you, we're just going to put you all in jail. Yeah. This is a continuation of nobody willing to step back and, and try to come to terms. This is, we are going to be proven right no matter how much we have to keep bullying forward. There's no brakes on the heresy train. The protesters brought back an old tradition from the American Revolution. Liberty poles. Yep. Uh, this was literally a pole that would be raised, you know, like a, like a, like just a timber, raised in the air and covered with papers with people airing their grievances. Uh, this was something we used to do, like I said, during the American Revolution. And Some of the people in these offices used to do it. Yeah. And, uh... Including Hamilton, oddly enough. Um, the federalized militia arrived, uh, in Carlisle, Pennsylvania on September 11th, 1794. Remember, this is the same day they're really trying <coughs> to negotiate peace with these people. On September 29th, just, you know, a few days later, an unarmed boy was shot by an officer whose pistol accidentally fired. <clears throat> Two days later... An itinerant person was bayoneted to death by a soldier while resisting arrest. For not wanting to go kill people. Yes, the man was actually working on an Irish work crew that was digging a local canal. He was in a work gang, and the troops literally just decided, hey, show me your papers. And he's like, no, I'm going to work. Leave me alone. There's no stop and frisk. They have no right to do this. They just did it anyway. And when he told them to fuck off, they stabbed him to death. Yeah. You know, they're the good guys. President Washington ordered the arrest of the two soldiers that had uh, bayoneted the civilian. Um, a state judge determined the death was accidental. Because you can accidentally stab someone to death. And both troops were released with no punishment. Um, Washington left Philadelphia, the capital of the United States at the time, yep. on September 30th to review the troops. Uh, this is the first, only, and last time a sitting American president marched as commander-in-chief. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Morgan, who was a veteran of the American Revolution, led some of the forces uh, under Washington. He had been promoted to Major General. But yes, Morgan led one wing of the militia army into western Pennsylvania. Uh, the massive show of force, nobody raised up against them. There was no 7,000 insurrections. These farmers stayed at home. Yeah, they like saw 600 dudes. They saw, you know, they saw 13 to 17,000 troops marching through their land, and they went, we don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Th this, is, this was the crux of this argument. Washington marched these troops through western Pennsylvania, to purely show them and everyone else in America that they would do it. That you will do what you're told or we will bring the troops in. But yeah, so like I said, troops marched into Western Pennsylvania and the, uh, the insurrection collapsed. Yeah, they, they pretty much lawful stomped them. The rebellion was done. Uh, by October of 1794, everything was over. Most of the prominent leaders of the insurrection had uh, fled west or been arrested. Remember, um, this is October, so this has been three days. Yeah. Didn't take uh, long. It took six months for those who were charged to be tried. Uh, most were acquitted due to, let's say mistaken identity. Everyone who got showed up, nobody was ever able to truly prove that they were there. Um, it really just got down to a point of no one was really willing to point fingers um, this was still a sore thing. Just unreliable testimony. Uh, two men were sentenced to hang. We'll get to that in a second. 
immediately before the arrests, uh, all of the rebels had fled into the mountain beyond the reach of the militia, which, uh, as written, was apparently a huge disappointment to Hamilton. How is this guy not a supervillain? Hamilton actually wanted to bring all of the rebel leaders back to Philadelphia and put them on a public trial. Yeah. I mean, he wanted some of these guys hung for treason. That's how deep he wanted to push this. The, t the actual two men who were convicted uh, were a Philip Wiggle and John Mitchell. Uh, Wiggle had beaten up a tax collector and set his house on fire. Again, in any scenario, there's always going to be the outliers of those who take it a little bit too far. Um, Mitchell was a different story, though. He was yeah, actually a mentally impaired man um, who had been convinced by other people to rob a U.S. mail carrier. And he was literally duped into doing something stupid. And for this, they tried him for treason. For treason, and were going to hang him. Thankfully, thankfully, at some point, the, the idea of, of, of liberty kind of returned to the scenario, and uh, Washington didn't want anything to do with this. He pardoned these two men. He wanted everything to go back to normal. He wanted it all to be let go. He wanted it to all calm back down. He was tired of this. But yeah, while violent opposition to the whiskey tax ended, political opposition continued. Yep. This was the real breakthrough. Uh, the rioters couldn't win by force. The, the, the state government and federal government system had already been in place. There, there was no way these men were going to change their minds. But what they were able to do, they built their own political party. They got together. They decided, we're going to vote them out. And they did. And the Federalist Party was effectively destroyed. Uh, Hamilton never got to see himself in, president, in the presidency, which was his plan. Yeah. Um, and Washington, after his two terms, no doubt, went home and started his own whiskey distillery. What the As fuck? you do. Because rich white dude's going to do rich white dude shit. The, uh, the whiskey tax was eventually repealed, um, yep. and as were all excise taxes amongst in, uh, in the states until the War of 1812. Um, but yeah, this was, this was a dark moment in an infant America. Yeah. Like, day two, they start off bad. Yeah. And it didn't get better until the Federalist Party was crushed in 1800. You, you always hear about you know the good old days of America, but it's even, at the, and roses. even at the beginning, they just they weren't. No, America is a great place, but it's it's also really screwed up. Yeah, the Great Experiment was never supposed to just be something we we accepted. We accepted and loved. It's supposed to constantly be changing. Constantly be changing. Constantly yeah. being questioned. Can we do it better? Yeah. But these people knew they weren't going to do it better. Yeah. They, they set up a way to make it better, but even they themselves failed to do that a lot of times. And this yeah. is one of those ways it shows that even the mythological best of us yeah. were just men. They weren't saints. We can't hold them up to such things. Um, just hope at the end of the day, a lot of the things we at least see in history books maybe weren't attributed to malice, but no, we don't know. Except for Hamilton. Hamilton was the devil. Yeah. I'm going to hold to that. I don't care. Yeah. I guess to Washington and those... And the whiskey farmers. Those fine rebels who just wanted to drink their whiskey. Absolutely. And cheers. To Hamilton's grave. I'm glad he got shot. Me too. All right, guys, that's going to be it for another episode of Inebriated Antiquity. Uh, we hope you like it. We hope you comment on it. Hope you subscribe to it because we enjoy doing it. We imbibe, you subscribe. But anyway, I've been Tate. I'm Adam. Remember, hit that muffin button. Muffin button.